This program is brought to you by the ABA National Conference of Federal Trial Judges and the ABA Law Student Division. My name is Jonathan Schertz. Uh, I am the ABA Law Student Liaison to the Judicial Division Council and a law student at the University of Idaho College of Law. I will be serving as the moderator for this panel today. Joining us are the Honorable Jay Michelle Childs, United States District Judge, District of South Carolina, Deborah Morgan, Career Law Clerk to the Honorable Margaret B. Seymour, United States District Judge, District of South Carolina, Ethan Burkop, Term Law Clerk to the Honorable Jay Michelle Childs, and Leslie Slew, Law Clerk to the Honorable J. Frank J. Bailey, United States Bankruptcy Court, District of Massachusetts. Before we get things started, I would like to remind law students that ABA membership is free. The ABA has also just introduced premium benefits, which include the savings of $250 on Barbary Bar Review, $25 off West Academic Casebooks, and a legal ethics bundle that includes a free Model Rules of Professional Conduct ebook. Upgrade to premium for just $25 at abaforlawstudents.com slash gopremium. As part of both the free and the premium ABA memberships, law students may join up to five of the sections, divisions, or forums of the ABA free of charge. No matter what your interest in the law is, there's something out there for each of you. I would personally like to encourage each of you to join the ABA's Judicial Division and its Lawyers Conference. Within the Judicial Division, the Lawyers Conference is the home to lawyers, court managers, legal teachers, writers and publishers, and law students interested in the advancement of the judiciary. As the current law student liaison to the Judicial Division Council, I can assure you that the, that the judiciary not only wants to hear from law students, they need to hear from us. Come join us and see how you can help make a real difference both today and in the future. So securing and preparing for a federal clerkship can be a daunting task even for the best law students. How do you stand out in the application stacks? What are judges looking for? What should, we, should you expect during an interview? Should you be taking specific classes? There's a webinar called Demystifying the Judicial Clerkship Application Process and Experience that was presented by the Law Student Division and the ABA National Conference of Federal Trial Judges that seeks to answer these questions and more. You can view the webinar replay and download the related resources online. So let's get going. We'll start off with Ms. Deborah Morgan and Mr. Ethan Burkott talking about preparing for your clerkship once you have it. Ethan, did you want to lead off on this one? Sure. Um, thanks, Jonathan, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, as you can see on the, uh, the, the PowerPoint, if it's up uh, on your screen, uh, first thing we want to talk about, the panelists want to talk about, is responsibilities of federal law clerks and um, what you can expect to do as a federal law clerk, the main things you're going to be doing is researching complex legal issues. Now, that may seem obvious as that's exactly what courts do, but that's pretty much 90% of the job. Um, you'll basically be drafting bench memos and orders and working closely with your judge to figure out how exactly the judge wants to rule. Um, and that's just the basics. Um, you'll also have to work very closely with the clerk's court uh, to figure out exactly you know how to um, how you're going to uh, put those orders out there, how to deal with incoming motions, and things like that. Um, Deborah, do you have anything you wanted to add particularly particularly just to the basics of the responsibilities of federal law clerks? Um, I think these are the things that are obvious, but these are the things that make clerking the best job in the world as well. Um, these complex legal issues. For example, we come across so many things that you never heard of in law school. Um, and then the first time we came across the Carmack Amendment, and it was like, you know, what is that? Um, and so you have an, uh, an opportunity to, to hone research skills by starting with um, topics that you may have never heard of or topics that maybe you never paid attention to in uh, law school, like. Uh, constitutional law, for, for example, I never had any uh, idea I would be working with constitutional law now every day. Um, but you learn um, to start with your treatises and work through any statutory law, case law, and learn to really figure out what the bottom, um, you know, what the bottom line is and how to uh, research that issue and not have a huge, um, overwhelming uh, 
topic in front of you. So all these kind of things, um, you're working with the legal issues and, and writing your memos are just, um, are, uh, just invaluable for practice, I think, in the future as well. As far as working with the uh, clerk of courts is something I wanted to point out particularly. Um, <clears throat> as you're beginning your career right after law school, I, I don't think I realized this, and I'm sure a lot of people don't, um, it's just how important, especially to the federal judiciary, the clerk of court, the clerks of court can be. Um, generally, uh, lawyers have a lot of questions about, you know, how to how to file certain uh, uh, submissions they want to give to the court, how to um, how particularly to uh, to put those together, and how to get them in the in the judge's hands. And often they'll try to call chambers to do that, especially when they're uh, new to the practice. And we always have to, as, as a law clerk, I always have to make sure to send those people directly to the clerk of courts because certainly I don't know how to do most of that stuff um, uh, right off the bat. But the clerk of courts are experts at it, and they are willing to help you with just about any question you have. So if you ever have a question about dealing with uh, something on the docket, something on CMECF, the clerk of courts is a great resource. They will just be able to help you right right away. Isn't that right, Deborah? Well, I, I agree totally. And uh, another good thing about that um, is working with the clerk's office, you kind of get to see the big picture and how everything fits together, not just what you're doing in chambers, but how that affects the whole timeline of litigation. Um, you know, for example, you might get a, a, a email from the uh, courtroom deputy saying, well, these cases are ready for trial in June according to the scheduling order. And you look at them and see, well, do I have a summary judgment motion? Can I get rid of that? Um, you know, do a bench memo, have a hearing, dispose of it in time. Um, so if this needs to go to trial, that the parties can get their witnesses together and their experts and be ready for a trial date. And then you have to let um, how that affects letting the jury people uh, know to send out questionnaires and how many to send and if there are any special issues. Um, and, and that progresses on to jury selection. And so it's, uh, you know, you're part of a bigger process and um, that is something else, you know, you work clerk closely with the clerk's office on and, uh, you know, also gives you, again, this kind of three-dimensional view of how the court system works. Um, and also I found that the the clerk's office saved my um, saved my job probably more than one time. Uh, you know discovering a typo or you know did you is this you know what about this uh, counterclaim is it to be dismissed or things you know procedural issues like that that um, you know maybe in concentrating on one thing I had um, overlooked and and forgotten to remind the judge about so um, they certainly um, play a huge part in, in our chambers as well. Uh, the final item that I did not yet mention on this slide is preparing for hearings and trials. And uh, no matter what you've heard, hearings, although rare, do actually occur, and trials sometimes occur even less frequently. Um, and the clerks are usually responsible, federal law clerks are usually responsible for helping the judge prepare for them. Um, by far, and Deborah, I think you can probably back me up on this, by far the most common types of hearings are going to be in criminal cases because you have uh, Rule 11 plea hearings and sentencings. Um, but my experience has been, uh, and you can, you can tell me what your experience is, that um, judges tend to handle that side of things mostly on their own because they're so common, and they usually uh, look to the law clerks to help them with more civil matters. Is that your experience? Well, um, and I think that depends on the judge. Um, yes. My judge, um, we are, and I think this is unusual, in, in, at least in, maybe in South Carolina, but we do um, assist her in terms of, you know, reviewing guilty pleas and um, uh, motions to suppress, um, things of that nature on the criminal side. But you're right, most of the um, involvement in uh, for hearings would be uh, on the civil side for summary judgment or, um, you know, sometimes discovery disputes, things of that matter. Um, so the uh, we we do have a good number of hearings on, on the civil side. Um, 
and of course it's so important always to be sure your judge is prepared with the party's arguments and uh, what the law is and uh, maybe other issues that the parties didn't explain or um, you know didn't articulate well in their in their briefings and so that the judge um, there's nothing worse feeling for me than the parties start arguing something and the judge to look perplexed because you know maybe I forgot to mention it <laughs> or sometimes they bring up something brand new as well um, so um, all those things are important to be sure the judge is prepared to address the attorneys um, yeah and usually for for me I uh... I think for most law clerks as well, usually you prepare a memorandum summarizing the arguments and especially highlighting arguments that aren't, aren't very well articulated. And then uh, my experience has been off, often the judges wanting you to um, put in there some pointed questions just to make sure that if there's anything that's unclear, uh, the judge knows exactly what question needs to be asked. Right, right. Um, I agree. Leslie, I wanted to ask you, uh, before we move on too much, uh, just briefly, can you explain how it might be different in bankruptcy practice? Right. Well, the bankruptcy practice is primarily right now consumer. Um, so you are dealing with a lot of pro se litigants. And given the flow of the cases in bankruptcy court, the law clerks are responsible for a lot of the day-to-day -day oversight of the cases in conjunction with the clerk's office. So um, I think that the bankruptcy law clerks might have uh, a more, they might touch the case a little bit more. Um, also, we hear uh, evidentiary hearings and trials quite a bit. Currently, we have hearings scheduled two days a week. Um, they're, they're pretty full days. Um, so there is a lot of hearing preparation in the bankruptcy cases, and there are also a lot of emergency expedited things that come up because um, sometimes these debtors have urgent financial needs and they need uh, permission from the court to do something or a creditor might require relief from stay. So evidentiary hearings and trials in bankruptcy court are quite common. Um, but on the other hand, we don't see any criminal. So that's, that's a significant <laughs> Jonathan, are we uh, going to move on to this next topic? Yeah, go right ahead. Oh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, this uh, next topic, uh, as you can see on the slide, is what you can expect if you become a federal law clerk. And I just have a few items I wanted to talk through briefly. Um, first, I want to mention that uh, law clerks usually need to be generalists, and generally are uh, generalists, um, because you need to master a wide array of legal issues. Many term clerks um, are new. They're right out of law school, and they're not going to be experts in any particular area of the law at all. Uh, judges and career clerks, they might be experts in one area of law, but certainly they're not going to be experts in all areas of law. And as a federal court, you're going to just be getting many different types of cases coming your way. And so law clerks, uh, they need to be able to make authoritative rulings on issues that they're going to be new to. And that can be both fun and scary. It's fun because, you know, as, as you've gone through law school, you like, you enjoy, hopefully, learning new topics and, and finding out uh, your view on certain issues. Um, but it can also be scary because you're coming, uh, you're receiving briefs and you're receiving oral arguments from attorneys who clearly are experts in their field, and they expect you to be at least uh, understanding some of their arguments. And this is where your research skills that you've developed in law school or even elsewhere become very important because you need to be able to get up to speed right away because you're expected to start mastering a lot of these issues as a federal law clerk. Um, the next item I wanted to talk about, um, I think this may be a strong word, but uh, isolation. Um, maybe a better word would be uh, independence. Um, the idea is that uh, even though clerkship experiences vary widely according to whatever court you're in or whoever judge, whichever judge you're working for, um, in my experience, and I've worked for three courts, you're relatively working independent. Um, you do have some amount of collaboration with perhaps your co-clerks or the judge, but um, you're expected to produce your own work independently and without a whole lot of guidance. Um, and this, what this looks like practically is you end up spending a vast majority of your time uh, sitting at your desk 
and uh, or if you prefer to, to stand stand at your desk, you can do that too. Um, and you end up reading a lot and researching and, and writing. I mean, it's basically what you've been trained to do in law school, um, and that's all you're going to be doing for the most part. Um, like I did mention in the in the previous uh, section, there is going to be there's going to be some hearings, and you need to be able to prepare for that too. But the vast majority of your time is is, is working independently. So uh, th those two items kind of go together, isolation and independence. Um, I do want to mention, uh, in my experience at least, there's not a lot of interaction with counsel. Um, you do get to see counsel, especially if you go to hearing, and you get to see the briefs that they submit. So you get the opportunity and experience um, to figure out what, what good lawyering looks like and also to see what bad lawyering looks like. So you both get to, uh, you get to both um, decide how you would like to emulate somebody or decide that you don't want to emulate uh, particular practices. Um, but those two things, I think across the board, um, this I, the idea of isolation and independence, those kind of go across the board with all types of federal clerkships. I think if you're, in, um, if you're working for an appellate court, I used to work for one, um, this is going to be even more so. Uh, you're just not going to have the chance to interact with counsel, um, hardly at all. Uh, unless you're at oral arguments, and even then, um, you're probably going to be relying more on the briefs. Um, so you really need to practice your ability to work independently from others. Um, that doesn't mean you want to just be some sort of um, uh, introvert and never talk to anybody. You still need to get along with your colleagues, and you need to learn that skill for sure. But much of the clerkship experience, you should expect to be able to produce quality work and do it independently, because that's what your judge will expect. Um, the last item I wanted to mention is uh, the type of time constraints you'll be facing. Um, it, federal, uh, federal courts don't really have a particular, uh, a lot of scheduling uh, going on. You do have uh, certain deadlines, um, particularly the Civil Justice Reform Act that, that tells you when certain motions and have to be decided and when uh, certain cases have to be decided. But for the most part, you're kind of working on your own. And you need to be able to be flexible um, in meeting your deadlines. And I, I saw one of the questions that came up before we started this was, um, uh, how exactly do you balance um, uh, uh, deadlines? Because clearly you're going to have a bunch of responsibilities on your plate. And how should federal clerks uh, balance all those? And the, the answer isn't very profound. It's simply uh, you need to be able to prioritize. You need to figure out as you move along uh, what item is more important than every other item. And there's no magic bullet to that. Um, federal court, courts are very busy, and as many of you know, probably have heard in law school, they, they are viewed as overburdened to some extent. So you need to be able to say, okay, I know I can't get everything done today. What must I get done today? And then I can move on to the next thing next week or next month or <laughs> even within the next six months. Uh, so those three items, I, those three items, I think, uh, kind of cover the gamut of um, of clerkship experiences. Well, thank you, Ethan. Uh, Leslie, Deborah, anything that you want to add about all that? Uh, no. Uh, again, these are great skills. I think um, when you go into private practice, um, particularly, Susan was talking about being able to prioritize. You know, look at the things that you have to do now, next week, next month, um, and be able to keep a lot of balls in the air. Um, you know, these are all great qualities that translate, I think, into private practice. I would agree with that. And with the time management, uh, the time management and prioritizing, I think that if you run into a, a situation where you can't prioritize, you'll get the assistance of your judge or the career yeah. clerk to, to help you yeah. figure out what should be done first. Um, that can be very helpful. Well, I would have to agree there. So let's move on, Deborah. Have you, let, let's talk about the qualities of successful law clerks. Um, well, <laughs> um, you're, to be a successful law clerk, you really only need to do one thing and only remember one rule, and that is to always make your judge look good. And so that's your guide to everything that you do, really. Um, you want to be sure that they're completely prepared for court with your bench memos, uh, they have questions or the 
if they need to, to ask, those things that we've already covered. Um, their signature goes on uh, any order uh, that goes out there into the world. Uh, and so, you know, it needs to be, you need to be as manic meticulous, excuse me, as possible. Um, we're all human. You'll, you know, nothing worse than looking on Westlaw and seeing a typo jump out at you that you never saw after you read it three times. But, you know, you want to have, um, like, the, the, uh, this clear style of writing. Now, in chambers are all different, and judges are different how they want to present their orders. But in our chambers, we kind of stick with the IRAC structure, or what they call it now, but, you know, just very issue rule analysis conclusion no editorializing we have a rule that we don't even use adverbs or adjectives um, that's how our judge uh, you know likes her opinions uh, to be presented um, so those kind of things are important I think one of the most important and my judge has said this many times but the most important uh, key to being a successful law clerk is to be intellectually honest um, and matter of fact, be honest in every respect, but you know don't be a, an advocate. you're here to present the judge with both sides um, of the litigation and and present the you know your research to her in a even handed manner um, and so the judge being able to rely on you is you know and and the things that you tell her and recommendations that you make is just um is just critical. Um, the uh, kind of related to that is being, like I said, being forthcoming, being honest with the judge. If you make a mistake or something comes up, don't try to cover it up or pretend it'll go away. It's sometimes it's painful, but you just have to, you know, go in and and uh, say, "What well, made this mistake?" or "This issue has come up," and to always be perfectly honest with your judge. Um, always you you also need to remember that you're the alter ego of the judge really and you represent the judge out in the world um, and to kind of conduct yourself accordingly particularly you know if you're at a bar meeting or something like that where people know who you are um, the I think this is important on the slide where it says about researching your judge um, this can make it for an unhappy year or two with the judge, uh, both for the law clerk and for the judge. If you just don't see eye to eye, you know, fundamentally, um, if you just have a strong views um, about particular areas of the law or particular problems in society, and they're not, um, you know, they're going to affect your writing and affect your view of. Um, you know, what kind of conclusions should be made, um, and it's just completely diametrically opposed to how your judge feels about um, the same kind of issues, and that's just, it's going to be just a miserable experience. So it is important to, um, if you're applied, don't just apply, you know, to every judge in the world, but to, um, to see if you can glean from opinions, um, you know, what kind of uh, uh, view that the, the judge might take and whether these are things that you can live with at the end of the day. Um, it's a hard, I've seen sometimes for law clerks in criminal matters to um, come into court and see the judge sentences somebody in life in prison and, uh, you know, on a drug case and maybe this person has feelings that the drug laws need to be changed and, and to be relaxed um, in some ways. And, you know, those are difficult things to kind of uh, reconcile with sometimes. So um, I think, I guess, say the most important thing uh, is just to keep in mind that everything that you do um, should, you know, be sure that the judge is, um, you know, held out uh, in in the community, in the world, in the, a manner that the judge um, would expect that kind of respect, um, and and to just be completely honest in in your dealings with the judge. Um, Ethan, what do you what do you think? Or Ethan, are you still there? <laughs> sorry, sorry, Deborah, I had it on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, 
No, that's fine. I, uh, I thought I, you were I, carried I, away. You were carried I, away by my. Um, yes, I was. Uh, I was. I was thinking it was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. I actually, actually agree with everything you, everything you just said. Um, I especially agree with your main point, which is um, your job is to make the judge um, hold the judge out like as a judge should be held out, uh, respected, um, and and that's pretty much your entire job. And you can do that in multiple ways. Quality work product, obviously, is is the is the best way to do it. But um, there's multiple ways to make sure that happens, and if you focus on that, everything else should just fall into place. I completely agree with that. Um, as far as uh, uh, researching your judge and making sure that you're you're uh, working for a judge you agree with, I also think that that is the easiest way to make sure that uh, you're going to be able to <laughs> to accomplish that task. I do think, um, for me personally, I, I can work for a judge that I disagree with um, on perhaps uh, certain views of the laws, as long as I believe that they are, um, right. as, long as, as long as I believe they're actually judging in a way that is, uh, in a way that I agree with. Uh, I might I might disagree on particular outcomes, but that's not a problem for me. Um, and I agree with you if you if you are uh, struck by that, if you have a problem with the way a judge sentences or uh, the way a judge. Uh, interprets uh, constitutional matters and it really affects you, then yeah, maybe you should stay away from uh, uh, applying to that particular judge. That's that's a great, great advice, I think. Leslie? Yeah, I think that, that researching your judge is, is very important. And in addition to reading opinions of your judge, um, I would also recommend, if you can, take a judicial writing class before you start your clerkship, um, because opinions are structured in, in a way for a reason and the format is somewhat consistent from court to court but there are techniques and styles that different judges use to um, convey the outcome or to um, you know, communicate to the parties so that type of writing course will give you the ability to look at opinions in a way that the court sees it. Now, lawyers read opinions very differently than, than courts view opinions. Um, so learning to, to read with that um, open mind and, and with a, an eye on the big picture I think would be very helpful. Um, in addition, I think that observing and listening to your judge is very important. Uh, your judge has had an, a, a, a career before she got on the bench. Um, she prefer certain styles and certain things. So take the opportunity to observe and, and use that to your benefit. Uh, I agree. And I um, let me, I guess, also say, um, even though as a law clerk you're not really an advocate um, and you, you know, you usually I think a good law clerk is on the same page with their judge, um, that doesn't mean that if you disagree with a judge that you shouldn't, um, you know, present your case. Um, and sometimes, you know, the judge might look at things in a different way, or you may as well, which of course is a great learning experience, but um, I think that all comes back to, to being honest uh, with the judge and, um, you know, being forthright and explaining a position if you have one that's different from the judge. And um, But then, as Ethan said, you know, their name goes on it and it's their opinion and um, you know, so ultimately that's your job is to communicate that, you know, to the litigants um, in a, you know, in a cogent manner. Um, so, thank you. Well, it definitely sounds like uh, learning, you know, from the feet of the judge that you're working with is a great benefit. But, Leslie, uh, what are some other benefits that, you know, happen that would make somebody want to pursue a federal clerkship? Sure. So you'll see on the PowerPoint slide that there are several bullet points. Um, I'm, I think I'm going to start with the the one at the you know second to the bottom, creating a reputation for yourself. I think that's for many uh, a very strong motivator to pursue the the clerkship. Um, clerks are somewhat mysterious um, because, as I believe it was Ethan mentioned before, you don't 
interact a lot with the the bar in general. However, they know you're there. They know you're smart, um, and and it does you do build a reputation for yourself without even really interacting directly with them. So I think that's a significant benefit. It can lead to wonderful career opportunities after you finish your your clerkship. Um, I think that one thing that we left off a slide that I think is, is worth mentioning, especially in today's climate, um, you're doing a public service. This is a job that has to be done. Um, these are cases filed by litigants and they need to be moved through the system. Um, when you have a motion, if it gets to the judge, it's probably a matter that is unresolved. Maybe the law is not clear on the issue. So you'll have the opportunity to research and write about topics that maybe no one else has written about. So there, there are unresolved issues that, that are, are, are going to, um, you'll, you'll encounter some cutting edge topics. Um, observing attorneys in action in court. You know, here in the bankruptcy court, we have hearings two to three days a week. Uh, we get to see good lawyering, bad lawyering. We get to see what styles a judge um, likes, what they don't like. Um, also, you get to learn about different practice areas. You know, in the bankruptcy court, bankruptcy touches everything. So you're learning about torts, contracts, real estate, domestic issues. You get to see all of it. Uh, so it's a nice little buffet of practice areas for you. Um, learning to be objective and intellectually honest. I think that this is a wonderful way to start out your career early. Um, you know, most of the lawyers, they're advocates, right? You're advocating for a side, but here you get to learn the law and view and weigh the pros and cons for, for a particular side. So I think that's a really good way as a new lawyer to, um, you know, have an introduction to the law. Um, and then you get to build relationships with your colleagues. It is somewhat of a closed community because you can't interact with um, attorneys as you would be able to if you were in private practice, um, but you do build a strong bond with other judges and other law clerks that you interact with. And um, one thing that I find invaluable about the clerkship is that you get to see how the court works from the inside. Uh, before I took this clerkship, I was an attorney in private practice, and I used to sweat everything, every single detail, because I didn't know what happened to my motion once I filed it with the court. I didn't know who was looking at it, what kind of consideration they were giving it. But having been on the other side, I can, you know, I have, I take a lot of comfort in knowing how much time the judges and the clerks spend on the matters that are filed by the parties and that they are really carefully considered um, so that after the clerkship, if I go back into private practice, I can, I can have more of an idea of the procedure and the process and the reasoning that goes on um, from the court's view. So, so I think that that is, is, is wonderful as well. It definitely sounds like it. Uh, Ethan or Deborah, anything that you would like to add about benefits that you have found? Um, I know I keep harping on this, but again, uh, these are uh, skills that translate, again, to private practice, uh, the ability to uh, write a motion that, um, you know, is set out in a way that, a, you know, a judge appreciates. Um, Lots of times in practice, you don't get hearings. You'll just you'll have to rely on emotions practice, and so that ability to do your research and and set out your arguments in a you know in a convincing way can translate um, out there. Um, the uh, ability to think on both sides, for example, you can uh, will translate uh, to be able to anticipate. Um, opposing counsel's arguments, for example, when you get into practice. So, um, you know, these are just great benefits that, um, you know, carry forward. I, I've often said I wish all law students could work for a judge because, you know, we'd have a, a whole better practice of law, I think, if people could really see everything that you get to see as a, as a law clerk. Uh, I'll just briefly emphasize the points that uh, Deborah and Leslie already made. I think. Um, <clears throat> the relational aspects of working for a court um, are the short-term benefits. I, I do think you do develop a reputation and having that courtship on your resume can open up doors that may not have otherwise been opened. Um, but I think the long-term the, the long benefit to me, the most important one that I've appreciated is exactly what Deborah said, seeing both sides of an issue 
and how Leslie put it, uh, stepping back and not having to be an advocate in any particular issue, um, really allows you to, to um, just have a perspective on what you're doing that's different than practice, I think. Fantastic. Well, Deborah and Judge Child, let's talk a little bit about ethics for law clerks and what law students should know about this particular area as they're looking at jumping into this. Yes, um, and it bears worth mentioning the title of this page, uh, title line, which is essentially that your professional and personal actions reflect on your judge and the judiciary as a whole. So there is a judicial code of ethics and canons that uh, law clerks are responsible for knowing about, but we've listed a lot of the common ethical issues here. First, there's always confidentiality. You should hold up the integrity and the independence of the office. You do not want to be speaking about your cases outside of the office. The office is very close-knit. There are decisions that have to be made, but you don't also want to give attorneys any insight into how the judges will think, what their preferences or biases are as well, because you want that judge to have their independent thought with respect to how they will uh, ultimately decide on any particular issue. With respect to the conflicts of issue, uh, interest, you're thinking about things like work. For example, there are times when interns or externs or even law clerks perhaps may come and then they want to do side jobs. You really should not be doing anything that is related to any type of legal matters outside of being in court because you never know if those matters may end up in uh, court even if it's not with your particular judge. We do encourage you to do other outside legal activities such as bar work, other community organizations and things of that nature. But of course, you're keeping close tabs on what your actual caseload is so that you can inform a judge if you have any interest in a particular case or a charity or anything that may come before the court, and you're just not to work on those particular matters. And the judge has to set up some process within the office to make sure that you're not exposed to any of that information. Basically, uh, with respect to your conflicts of interest, your outside legal activities, you're just trying to make sure that the judge can avoid uh, the appearance of impropriety, you know, in addition to avoiding impropriety in and of itself. So just even any appearance that you might know more about a case, there might be some particular bias, and because you want people to respect um, and be able to reflect uh, nicely upon your decision. When you're dealing with prospective employers, at some point, obviously, you'll leave the judge's chambers unless you're a career law clerk, and you'll get hired somewhere. So make sure the judge is aware of what firms or what entities you're interviewing with, because if you do get hired, then you'll no longer work on cases that are presented by those uh, parties or that particular firm. Uh, with respect to receipt of gifts and honoraria, we speak and we are public servants. I think Leslie um, ultimately mentioned that as well. You should be in that mindset that this is a very privileged opportunity. And so we uh, offer our knowledge and our expertise to the bar members, to various community organizations who want to know a little bit more about the judiciary. And we don't expect anything in return. We're not paid to um, enter into those uh, seeking obligations or opportunities. With respect to political activity, we uh, do not encourage or allow you to have any type of fundraising, any association with any particular political party. There should be no public endorsements and no use of federal resources, your computers and things of that nature to help out on any particular uh, campaign in that regard. And then finally, just respecting your judge, Ethan did mention you might disagree with certain opinions, but ultimately it's the judge's decision on how they are going to rule on any particular matter, and the judge's name and signature is on any particular decision, and they will be held responsible and accountable for how they have ruled. But that does not mean that we expect you to be subservient to us. We want people who will express their opinion, express their analysis, and then give the judge some insight because your input is very valuable. We have lots of complex issues to decide on a daily basis. We can't know everything. We are generalists. So please do um, be not afraid to express your um, opinion. We'll now move on to a lot of opportunities that we wanted to make sure that you all were aware of. Through the American Bar Association, we have the Judicial Clerkship Program, and that is a joint effort of the ABA Council for Racial and Ethnic Diversity. This meeting is usually held at the ABA mid-year in February, and there are various clerks, uh, potential uh, law students and, and minority law students who come from around the country, and they spend significant time with judges. There are panel discussions. 
they are given a research and writing exercise which the judge walks them through and critiques. They have interview, uh, mock interviews with the judges, and then there are a lot of informal social events so that you can actually meet judges. Many people have obtained clerkships and internships as a result of their participation. We also have the ABA section of litigation that has a judicial intern opportunity program where they place uh, various interns into the chambers of judges across the nation. And those internships tend to be uh, paid because they are opportunities within firms that are co uh, sponsors uh, for that program. We have some deadlines listed here, so do pay attention to those deadlines with respect to being able to get those opportunities. And then finally, the Just the Beginning Foundation is a summer judicial intern diversity project in which highly qualified minority, underrepresented, and economically disadvantaged law students are placed in chambers of federal judges for summer internships. Again, this is an opportunity for you to be in a judge's chamber six, eight, 10, 12 weeks and have the opportunity to do actual work that is uh, related to being a clerk. And then again, a lot of people have been able to uh, get a uh, clerkship off of those particular opportunities. So do take advantage of these various organizations' ability to um, get you through our process and have the opportunity to spend some time with some federal judges and other judges. Well, thank you, I, Judge Child, uh, Ms. Morgan, Mr. Morcott, and Ms. Sue. Uh, we have a few questions that have been uh, submitted to us beforehand that I think you know, would be great uh, to be addressed. And for anybody who is uh, live right now, uh, please, again, feel free to put any questions in the little questions box uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. And I uh, will see what we can do to make sure that we get those answered. Uh, but to start off with, and this is kind of for anybody who wishes to ask uh, or, or answer it, I should say, uh, what experiences in the law school did you have that really helped you prepare for this opportunity? I know we've, you know, somebody has mentioned you know, taking a judicial clerkship type course, uh, but what other experiences really helped you prepare for this? Um, this is Ethan. Uh, I can answer at least from my view. Um, I think the best thing you can do it's, is either intern or extern for a judge, um, and you can do that, you know, during uh, the semester or, or during the summers. Uh, getting that type of experience is, I think, invaluable if you intend to clerk, um, and even if you don't intend to clerk, I think it's at least gives you a view, um, you know in chambers of what's going on if you decide to go directly into um, into a, a firm life um, or to become a practitioner otherwise. I think the second best thing you can do um, to me is to engage in any type of experience that will allow you to write briefs. I think you're not really exposed to that much in the normal course of law school through classes or anything else, but if, if through moot court or through clinics or through practicums or anything like that, you're able to write briefs, I think that would be very helpful uh, experience before you become a clerk. Um, this is Deborah. Of course, I agree with everything Ethan says. Um, I guess maybe a couple of other things. I know um, we look at uh, other activities that uh, may be related to the law or even other activities that aren't um, of applicants um, kind of show uh, a well-roundedness and ability to you know, balance the quality of life with uh, school. Um, those things are important as well to you know, be involved in extracurricular uh, activities. Um, another thing that I wish I'd pay more attention to in law school is the rules of procedure. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, as, a, as a practical matter, it's amazing how much they drive uh, uh, so many things that are done. Um, and so I had a little learning curve with those <laughs> myself when I started. Uh, so I think that's a, a valuable class. Um, as well as the legal writing kind of classes. Right, we do have one question uh, from Julio, it looks like. I, 
And what he would like to know is, did all of you apply for a clerkship during law school, uh, or are recent law graduates still able to apply for these types of clerkships? Uh, this is Deborah. Um, I think that it goes, you know, uh, I know my judge looks at applicants um, from, you know, a wide variety of um, backgrounds. Um, I, I clerked um, on the state court level um, when I got off law school, and then I worked for a while, and then I escaped and was fortunate to have this uh, law clerk with my judge. Um, but we have um, had applicants who have worked for a while and then would like to kind of change, take a break, um, work for a, a judge and, you know, kind of uh, maybe reset uh, their ambitions. Um, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of uh, law firms sometimes will hire and then if they have an applicant who gets an opportunity for a clerkship, um, to go ahead and do that because it is so valuable to the law firm as well. So I don't think you, you know, if you have already graduated, then there's no reason to uh, not apply for a clerkship if it's uh, something of interest. This is right. Just, I got uh, my. I was, I'm sorry. This is I just, got my uh, clerkship. I would just add, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would just add that uh, with respect to the various judges, they all hire on different cycles. Look to the Oscar system to see if judges have posted, and then you can, of course, apply that way. But I also encourage people to just send the letters to the judge's office or at least contact their particular um, assistant or law clerk to see if the judge is accepting applications, because I myself have hired off of both systems where it's just receiving resumes, looking at those, um, setting up interviews, and then ultimately selecting someone, but then also through the Oscar system. Right. I was going to, um, about when, you, you know, if you have to apply for a clerkship straight out of law school, that's not the case. Um, I practiced for over 15 years before I got my clerkship, uh, and it was an opportunity that came up. Um, my judge doesn't hire through Oscar. He hires, um, he prefers that candidates apply directly to him, so you would want to check uh, with the judge to see how they accept applications. Um, and I know that some judges in the District of Massachusetts don't hire recent, like fresh law grads. They they prefer that the students have a or the lawyers have a few years of experience before they hire. So it depends on the judge. Um, but I think that you can apply for a clerkship at any time in your career. Well, one other question that I think would be a good one. I. And I, and I think maybe this would be good for all of you to answer. Um, what's the worst mistake you've made as a law clerk, and how did you address it? Uh, I can start with that um, very scary question. <laughs> um, uh, I worked at the Fourth Circuit for a while, uh, Federal Appeals Court, and um, I worked on two appeals at the same time that were, they, they involved the same issue essentially. Um, I finished the first one and um, presented it to a three judge panel and they all agreed with my recommendation. And, um, and as I re researched for the, for the second case that was again the same issue, I realized that I had gotten uh, an issue of law incorrect in the first case. Um, so dealing with the second one was easy. I mean, I just presented and made a different recommendation, but of course I still had to deal with what to do with the first case. And um, what I ended up doing was simply explaining, hey, um, the, uh, the, uh, the appellate uh, opinion or order, I forget which was, has already been out, but the mandate has not issued. It's not been long enough for the mandate to issue, so we can recall it real easily. Let's just do that. They all agreed to that disposition. Um, th what I learned from that is a couple of things. One, um, it matters what you recommend to judges because judges are relying heavily on you as a law clerk. <laughs> um, so you try to get it right in the first instance. Um, also, be very willing to own up to your mistakes because everybody makes mistakes. Judges understand that you're going to make mistakes. And um, that's how you fix it is by just saying, I made a mistake and trying to deal with it after the fact. If you try to cover it up, it's going to be much, much worse. 
Uh, this is Deborah. I, I agree with Ethan. I've probably made so many uh, mistakes in 21 years with my judge that uh, I can't remember them all. But the important thing is to, um, you know, be up front with the judge and, and say, you know, this thing happened. It might be on an opinion. It might be a phone call that you've taken or, you know, maybe even something in your private life um, that could she could find out about. Um, and just to, to be forthcoming, we're just human, and you just can do the best that you can. And uh, so, like Ethan said, owning up to a mistake and um, addressing it with the judge in a forthright manner is just always an important thing to do. This is Judge Childs. What I would add is that you always have to be very conscious and proud of your work product. So when you're giving the judge citations, make sure that you've actually looked those up, particularly if, if there's a pin site, but then also you're blue booking the citations and you're relying on the most current law. You will be handed many templates in chambers from various orders, and those are just guides only. That is something to help you uh, organize your writing uh, structurally. But at the end of the day, when you are finished and ready to present whatever it is to your judge, you want to make sure that you've taken the time to actually blue book it, perhaps shepherdize the case if you're relying on something pretty recent to see if it's criticized, overruled, what have you, and not relying on something that might have been written five years ago or so in chambers, but you're owning up on your work as you're presenting it at that time. Thank you for that, Judge Child. And just kind of as a follow-up for you, I, if a clerk does make a mistake I, and they own up to it, as Ethan did with his, I, is that something that is going to follow them long term, or is that something that can, can that they can get past and that you know will be used as a learning experience? Yes, it's just a learning experience. There are always mistakes that can be made, whether that how the document got filed inappropriately in the clerk's office, um, whether there was a miscitation. The issue is, as we've all discussed here, is owning up to it and then making sure you understand what has occurred and how do we fix it and move on. Um, you don't want anything to be hidden because then you uh, engage in a lack of trust, you know, perhaps in your relationship with your judge. The judge always has to feel comfortable with you to know that you've got their back, that you're trying to make them look the best with all of the decisions and various uh, things going on in that particular office, but you want to make sure that there's always that trust factor. Well, thank you. Any last thoughts from anybody? Well, clerking is a fabulous opportunity, so I do encourage you all to participate in some of the programs that we've outlined here that will help you get to those clerkships. But then don't feel afraid to just write your judges. I have several people who will write me and just ask for an opportunity to intern over the summer. Sometimes it's two weeks, sometimes it's longer. And those judges are very willing, in my experience, to accommodate students as kind of our public servant role as well, to assist you with your writing, assist you with the potential clerkship opportunity as well. So I do encourage you through your schools to also try to extern for a grade and things of that nature, but get in as much writing as possible if you're uh, interested in clerking. I would like to add that, uh, that there are other courts other than the United States District Court and the court of Courts of Appeals. Uh, don't overlook the Article I courts, the bankruptcy courts, um, if maybe a courtship in the district court or with the circuit is not um, within your sites. There are other courts where you can look and get some wonderful opportunities. Um, and I also know that there's an ABA program coming up in April on judicial internships and externships. It's on the 27th of April, so you should check that out. I know that in our chambers, um, a number of the term clerks that have been hired have it some point interned with the bankruptcy court, so that could be another opportunity for you to get a, a taste of what it's like to, to clerk as well. Well, that leads to uh, another question that we just had uh, popped in by Nathan. Uh, is it difficult to jump from state clerking experience to the federal level, if any of you have done that? 
this is Judge Childs. I actually was a state trial judge before I came here. One thing that students do need to recognize and acknowledge is that state court judges have a extremely heavy docket that requires a lot of in-court time because there's just so many more criminal defendants and so you'll have those issues but then you'll have a heavy docket with respect to trials. Uh, in many instances, the judges will ask for proposed orders from the lawyers and um, not as many of the drafts of opinions are done from scratch with the judges. They will um, finesse the uh, orders that are coming from the lawyers and the clerk will assist in that regard. In federal court, there's a lot more researching and writing. It's a lot uh, more quiet. We pick and choose which matters we believe uh, deserve a hearing. And so um, just think about the difference in the opportunity with respect to what it is that you wish to get out of it. If you expect to be in court a lot, then go to state court. If not, and you really want to uh, uh, amplify your writing, then go uh, here in federal court. But do know that you'll get those experiences as well here. Uh, this is Deborah. I clerked at the um, on our state level Supreme Court, um, which of course is different in terms of uh, what you're doing, uh, dealing with an appellate record rather than a, uh, at the trial level. But um, you know the law is um, is it's hard sometimes to, and we see it with law clerks. It's hard sometimes to realize that there is a difference in procedure between state courts and federal courts that you know you can't just go with what you remember the procedural rules in state court were um you know sometimes uh, the law is applied differently on a, you know federal courts have interpreted maybe a constitutional issue differently than the state court has um so you can um have some tension that way so it's not like just going from one to the other without any um uh, differences in your um in your uh, responsibilities that way. Well, thank you. I think that's about all the time that we have for questions. And you know, if you do have you know, questions as students, I would encourage you to go to your school's career career services office or whatever it may be called uh, and talk with them because they may have a list of students who have been clerks in the past who may be able to answer a lot of these questions. And in my own personal experience, they're always willing to just pick up the phone and talk with you if they have been a clerk in the past, especially if they have been a clerk for a judge that you want to clerk for. Give them a call, talk with them, I, you know, sit down for coffee, whatever the case might be, and just ask them what their thoughts are on the matter. And you know, I think that would be a great thing for for, for each of you to do. Uh, but I, you know, as we wrap up, I do hope that you know, the questions that you know, many of you have had coming into this have been answered. Uh, but really, I do want to thank you again, uh, Judge Childs, Ms. Morgan, uh, Mr. Moorcock, Ms. Sue, for this hopefully very helpful and informative discussion. I know I have found it as such. I, I also want to thank the ABA National Conference of Federal Trial Judges and the ABA's Law Student Division for putting this together. And you know, finally, last of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us today or for listening to this recording. Have a great day. <laughs>